All right, this is the last video of chapter two. This is video nine of nine. All right, so now we talked about how she talked. We're going to start right, actually, right here. And before we start, I want to just kind of re reiterate and say that, remember, she's reminiscing about her past, right? And that's that's the thing that she's going to hold on to because, you know, just childhood memories. And, and that's what's going to really carry her through this difficult time, okay? And as we see, um, sometimes reminiscing isn't always the best thing to do. Be that as it might, the scaffold of the Pillroy was a point of view that revealed to Hester the entire track along which she had been treading since her happy infancy. So she's talking about reminiscing right here. Standing on the immeasurable eminence, she saw again her native village of, Eng of England. So, so she's from Old England and her paternal home, a decayed house of gray stone with a poverty-stricken aspect but retaining a half-obliterated shield of arms over the portal, in token of antique gentility. She saw her fa father's face, with its bold brow and revered white beard, that flowed over the old-fashioned Elizabethan ruff. Her mother, too, with this look of heedful and anxious love, which it always wore in her remembrance, and which, ever, even since her death, had so often laid the impediment of a gentle rem remonstrance of her daughter's pathways. She saw her own face glowing with girlish beauty and illuminating all the interior of the dusky mirror in which she had been wont to gaze at. There she beheld another countenance, a man. So now she's thinking about you know her mom, her father, um, and, she, her, and then she talks about herself. But then she starts thinking about there's this man right from from um, old England, and we're going to see what this man is uh, of a man well stricken in years, a pale, thin, scholar like visage, right? So he's a smart old man with eyes dim and bleared by the lamp light that had served them to pore over many ponderous books. So he's read a lot, right? Yet these, those same bleared optics had a strange penetrating power when it was their owner's purpose to read the human soul. This figure of the study and the cloister at Hester Prynne's womanly fancy failed not to recall was slightly deformed with the left shoulder a trifle higher than the right. So this man is a bit deformed. He probably has a really bad state of scoliosis with the curvature of the spine, and his left shoulder is a lot higher than his right. Next rose before her, in memory, picture gallery, the intricate and narrow thoroughfareness, the tall gray houses, the huge cathedrals, the public edifices, ancient in date and quaint in architecture, and of a continental city, where a new life had awaited her, still in connection with the misshapen scholar, a new life but feeding itself on time-worn materials like a tuft green moss of a crumbling wall. And now she's talking about coming to Boston right here. And, and as she comes to Boston, um, she's not with this, this man, right? Whoever this man is, she's no longer with him, right? Um, but, but she's noticing, this is very interesting too, that um, these Puritans are still relying on old methods of running society. And, and that's how this green moss on crumbling wall is a symbol of that. Lastly, in lieu of these shifting scenes came back the rude marketplace of the Puritan settlement with all the townspeople assembled and leveling their stern regards at Hester Prynne, yes, at herself, who stood on the scaffold of the Pilroy, an infant on her arms, in her arm and the letter A in scarlet, fantastically embroidered with gold thread upon her bosom. Could it be true? She clutched the child so fiercely to her breast that it sent forth a cry. She turned her eyes downward at the scarlet letter and even touched it with her finger to assure herself that the infant and the shame were real. Yes, these were her realities. All had vanished. Thus ends chapter two.